Ladies and gentlemen, hello again, and welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. My name's Graham. This is an extra video in the Hot Start TBM 900 series. Extra videos are just a few moments away from the simulator, where we can look at some details from the flying series in a little bit more depth. Over the course of the series, I've talked about the angle of attack gauge, uh, or the alpha gauge if you prefer. It's fitted on top of the glare shield on the TBM 900. Looks a little bit like a heads-up display with uh, red, yellow, and green bars occasionally being displayed. I also mentioned how I think it's a very important instrument and how pretty much every aircraft, in my opinion, should be fitted with an alpha gauge for the pilots. So today we're going to look at angle of attack. In order to understand angle of attack, we do need to consider a little bit of physics theory. I'm not an expert at physics. Uh, my grades at physics were very average, to say the least. So we'll just muddle through and do the best we can. So this is a representation of a wing or an aerofoil. We've got the leading edge, the trailing edge, the lower surface, the upper surface, and the cord line running through the middle. The wing produces lift, which offsets the weight of the aircraft. So that kind of makes sense. And when lift and weight are balanced, the aircraft is in level flight. This relative airflow over the wing. This is the forward motion of the aircraft through the air. Now for the purposes of this video we're not going to consider the power and the drag of the aircraft, simply the relative airflow that the wing experiences. And if we increase that relative airflow by flying faster we get more lift. So that's probably very basic, it makes a lot of sense. You reduce the airflow, you get less lift. But as long as lift and weight are in balance, the aircraft will maintain level flight. If you pull back on the control column or pull back on the stick, you'll increase the angle of attack. The angle of attack is the angle the wing presents to the relative airflow. So the cord line is here, the relative airflow is here, this angle here is the angle of attack. And as you increase the angle of attack, you increase the lift. Now this only works up until a certain point. If we increase that angle of attack further, we end up with erratic and variable lift production. And this is the point we consider the wing to be stalled. It's still producing lift, but it's not producing lift that we can use in a sensible manner. The stall occurs at a certain angle of attack, the angle between the wing cord line and the relative airflow. Now to understand it in a little bit more depth, I was very kindly presented with these airfoil plots by Sasho, the developer of the TBM 900. And if you're in any doubt at all about the level of detail that's gone into this product, uh, consider the fact the developer was looking at the uh, wing section to make sure Explain was presenting the most accurate representation of this aircraft. So this is at zero angle of attack, just in my first diagram. You can see lift being uh, produced across the majority of the upper surface of the wing. Central pressure is here, and the uh, red lines here, that's the airflow is attached all the way to the trailing edge. The wing's working really quite well there. We increase the angle of attack, we get more lift. The centre of pressure moves forward ever so slightly, but we're getting a lot more lift for that, and the airflow is still attached over the trailing edge. So that wing is producing more lift than the previous slide. Increase the alpha a little bit more, and there's more lift as well. We're starting to see a little bit of flow separation at the back here, a little bit of uh, flow coming off the wing surface itself. So it's starting to break down towards the trailing end of the airfoil, but the wing is still working. All the way up until a point called CL max, that is the maximum amount of lift that that wing is able to provide. You can see where the lift is distributed from front to rear of the airfoil and see this significant flow separation at the trailing edge. If you've ever seen videos done of uh, aircraft wings, either in, a, in a, a wind tunnel or in flight testing with little tufts of wool stuck onto the wing, that's to show where the turbulent flow is. It shows the separation point where the tufts of wool are stretched back. It's in laminar flow. And where the tufts of wool are uh, all over the place, it's in turbulent flow. So this wing is producing the maximum amount of lift possible for us. Now, if we ask that wing to work a little bit harder, the result will be an aerodynamic stall. We've got significant flow separation across the wing. 
It is still producing lift, but that lift production is now becoming erratic. It will lead to control difficulties, and those control difficulties will produce variations in the flight path that are largely uncommanded. And if one of those variations in flight path causes the alpha to increase even further, you have fully separated flow. There's still lift, but the flow separation is across the entire wing, and you're in the very real territory of a departure from controlled flight. So the modern lift formula is where the physics come in. And uh, as I said, I'll do my best to muddle through this in the hope it makes sense for you. It looks complicated to begin with, so we need to break it down. If you're an aerospace engineer watching this or an aerodynamicist, I'm sorry. This is going to be a rather crude explanation of your science, but we'll walk through it. So in the lift formula, we've got lift on one side. We've got true airspeed in there, that's uh, V squared. We've got coefficient of lift, density, and wing area. Now I want to make this easy to understand. So let's call the coefficient of lift and the wing area the wing shape. That leaves us with lift, density, and true airspeed. If I want to remove density and true airspeed, I can just call it dynamic pressure, and then we'll just consider density to be sky magic. We can practically ignore it. And if we're calling it sky magic, I may as well move from dynamic pressure to indicated airspeed, because indicated airspeed is a direct presentation of dynamic pressure. So the units we've got that matter now, lift and indicated airspeed. Now for the purposes of the rest of this video, I want you to think about the wing shape as if it includes the angle of attack, the angle that presents the wing to the relative airflow. As a pilot, we're not really interested in the ins and outs of how our wing works. We know that we've got flaps and slats that can change the shape of the wing. But what we're really interested in is when the wing's working and when the wing's not. So consider, for the rest of this video, the point at which the wing stalls, the angle of attack at which the wing stalls. Okay? It allows us to simplify the understanding of the wing by simply saying that lift varies with the wing shape and the airspeed squared. The point the wing stalls is an angle of attack. So if an aircraft is in level flight at 1G and as an example stalls at 100 knots, if it was in a 60 degree bank turn maintaining level flight so it's pulling 2G, its airspeed it would stall at would be 141 knots. Okay, lift varies with airspeed squared. So for a given wing shape, the wing will always stall at the same angle of attack. That's the number one takeaway from this video. Stall and angle of attack. Those are the only items that matter when you consider the wing's performance when you're handling the aircraft. So whenever MD says the words stall speed to you, I want you to think about a little asterisk on the end of stall speed. There's some considerations about the stall speed. It's only accurate at a specific weight. If the aircraft gets heavier or lighter, the stall speed changes. It will be affected by the power setting. If you have propellers out on the wings on a twin engine uh, aircraft, the airflow over the wings will be accelerated by the airflow, or they could be blanked by the airflow at a low power setting. It will change based on the angle of bank. An aircraft in straight and level flight will stall at a lower speed than an aircraft in banked and otherwise level flight. It will also change with control applications. Remember, if you pull back on that stick, pull back on the control column, the tailplane, the elevator, produces a download. It's more apparent weight that the airfoil has to offset. Effectively, it's making the aircraft seem heavier to the wing may or may not contain traces of nuts, and so on and so forth. I think you get the idea. Stall speed is a, a very nuanced concept. I want you to think about angle of attack whenever you're handling an aircraft close to the limits. For a pilot, angle of attack is about how hard is the wing working right now, and most importantly, how much more does it have to give? And that's what the angle of attack gauge shows you. 
Let's have a couple of examples. Here we are, climbing through 5,000 feet, 124 knots, climb power set, two units in the green on the alpha, and as I roll into a turn, the margin reduces, it's down to one green bar now. The wing has less uh, headroom, if you like, it's got less uh, to give you. And as you roll back to level, you get more alpha margin. Here we are, well into the red now, just approaching level stall speed. Stall. Stall. We stall at approximately 95 knots, three bars in red on the alpha gauge. I'm not stalled at 96 knots. I roll into the bank Stall. Stall. and there's a stall Stall. indication. Stall. Just Stall. by rolling into the bank, I didn't change the speed of the power Stall. setting. As I reduce Stall. the angle of bank, Stall. 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 the alpha Stall. margin increases. Stall. 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 And then we come out of the stall again. The alpha gauge is showing you how close to the stall you are. And the stall speed is largely irrelevant. We said it was 94 knots. But here we are, slow. triggering a stall at 130 knots. And similarly, by unloading the airfoil, by pushing down, I'm all the way back at 85 knots with the wing fully working because it's not been asked to produce as much lift. The alpha gauge tells Getting you slow. how much extra the wing has to give. If the alpha gauge is in the red, you're in real trouble. Reduce the pressure on the aircraft. Same for a steep turn. Here we are, about 125 knots, 50, 52 degree angle of bank, level turn. And I keep pulling and pulling and reducing the speed. And despite the fact we're doing 120 knots, we get the stall. Again, at three red bars on the angle of attack. Stall. 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 As I reduce the back pressure and roll out of it, it reduces. So you'll notice throughout the videos that the stall warner was going off and yet I was still able to retain control of the aircraft. That's because there's a tiny margin between the angle of attack that the stall warner triggers at and where the, air, where the uh, airfoil itself is stalled. Not all aircraft have got a stall warner. An aircraft uh, from a long time ago that I've got quite a few hours on has no stall warner whatsoever. The only warning of an approaching stall you have is a tiny little bit of buffet through the airframe and then the aircraft will drop a wing. So if you end up in a stall at low level, you can be in real trouble with that aircraft. Having an angle of attack gauge on the TBM is incredibly useful because it moves from a digital stall, no stall indication from the warner to a progressive indication that you're asking a little bit too much of the wing. You're asking it to work a little bit too hard. You need to help it out by reducing the back pressure or by increasing the airspeed. I hope that makes sense. It's a complicated subject. I'm trying to explain it in a simple and quick manner. If you do have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section. Thanks for listening and I hope you'll tune in for the rest of the video series.